Jews Dreams of Palestine by Hannah Mushabek. We wait in bed for our father to come home from work. We know he's coming when we hear the Queen's jingle in his pockets as he walks up the stairs. Sometimes he whistles us to sleep. Sometimes he tells us stories. We like the stories best. There's a story about how he fed his neighbour Muhammad so many beans that he farted powerfully enough to lift off the ground. No way! <coughs> and there are stories about our homeland, a place we've never been. Every summer my father visited his grandparents, Teta Maria and Sido Abu Michael, who lived in the old city of Jerusalem. The final day of one visit started with his favourite breakfast, cake. Yalla Majid. Tata Maria called through the window to a street vendor below. She dropped a basket on a rope and up it came, delicious bread, still warm. No matter how much food my father ate, Tata Maria always told him, eat more, Habibi, eat more. His sido was a stern-looking, tarbouche-wearing, argile puffing, mustachioed man. He was always busy with grown-up matters. But this bright morning, Sido announced that together the two of them would visit the family cafe. <coughs> Walking through the streets of East Jerusalem, my father and his Sido stopped every few paces to greet people and tell stories. Abu Michael was called al Mukhtar, the head of the community, and he spoke many languages. They walked hand in hand through a bustling collection of colourful vendors. Men and women sold everything from olive oil soap with rose water and heaping bags of za'atar to gold jewellery and embroidered textiles. As they walked, they were serenaded by sounds, the chanting of the Muazzin's call to prayer mixed with the ringing of church bells and the market vendors singing the praises of pickling cucumbers or prickly pears. Cucumbers as small as baby's fingers. Prickly pears so delicious they melt in your mouth. They could hear the cheerful sounds of children practicing dabaki, dancing and songs of um kum that blasted from radios on windowsills. But what fascinated my father most was the juice vendor. A short man, he carried a big tank filled with jalab on his back. He travelled by foot from neighbourhood to neighbourhood to announce his arrival. He played beautiful, intricate rhythms using brass cups and saucers. To his tetas horror, my father later practised these same rhythms at home using her china. Ya Allah, Michael! Now a professional drummer, he shows me and my sisters the juice man's rhythms by drumming on our backs, like a musical massage. At the family cafe, my father was greeted quickly with one kiss on each cheek by Amun Mituri. He was then put to work cutting cucumbers, chopping parsley and preparing plates of olives and pink pickled turnips. The cafe was a popular destination for great thinkers, poets, musicians, historians and storytellers gathered to listen to the exchange of ideas at Al Mukhtar's cafe. With a rare smile, Sido signalled to my father to follow him down a hallway. Sido unlocked the iron gate and led him to a lush, sunlit garden. Hundreds of homing pigeons rustled in their wooden cages in the shade of a proud olive tree. The next moment he released all the pigeons and skillfully guided them into a circle in the sky with the help of only a black piece of cloth tied to the end of a long stick. With surprise and delight, my father asked, Won't they fly away? Sido shook his head slowly, and the key swaying at his side, This is their home. That was the last day my father saw his grandfather, the last time he saw Palestine. Our eyes are heavy with sleep, but we want to hear more. Show us the key, we cry. My father produces the large, rusted old key to our family's home in Jerusalem. We know the ending of the story is not a happy one. 
We know that we may never sit and watch The Juice Man by Jaffa Gate, but we whisper the hope of return as we turn out the light. At night we dream of our homeland. Author's note, my sisters and I grew up hearing stories of our homeland from our mother, father, aunts and uncles. Sometimes I learned my history at family gatherings when the grown-ups became nostalgic and argued about how we were related to various people. No, you're second cousins on both sides, not first cousins on one side. My family laughed about old stories between the hard times and during too. Sometimes stories were told to my mother by my father's mother, a bond between women, secrets meant to be passed like recipes to our daughters. Some day I hope to pass these stories on to my own children, just like I'm sharing this one with you. The stories told to me and my sisters before bed in the room we shared were the best. In the same night we would hear a tale of a hero climbing a tower to rescue a magical princess and then we would learn about our father as a boy, skillfully evading grumpy priests and stealing sweets from his tetter's kitchen. Now it's hard to remember which were fairy tales and which were true, as the stories blend together and our homeland feels more and more like a magical place. My family lived in the Katamun neighbourhood in West Jerusalem until May 15th, 1948, the day Palestinians called al Nakba or the catastrophe. On this day, all my relatives, after being warned of danger, packed small bags, locked their doors, piled into my grandfather's car and took sanctuary in the Greek Orthodox monastery next to the church of the Holy Sepulchre in East Jerusalem. They were never allowed to return to their homes and to this day carry with them the keys to their houses, now occupied by others. As the Mukhtar, my great-grandfather was permitted to live at the Covenant until he died. His relatives, including my father, visited the old city of Jerusalem each summer until the 1967 war prevented them from returning. Like many refugees, the rest of my family scattered across the world. I have relatives in Chile, Peru, Canada, Switzerland, Jordan, Lebanon and the United States. We speak different languages, we celebrate different holidays, we eat different food. But one thing we all share, stories of our homeland.